Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm really, really excited to have so many of you here. As I said, we will try to have plenty of breaks so that people can move around as well because we do have a really packed house. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about the trajectory of civilization and this is part of um, Forsyth Salons on the topic of strengthening civilization. Um, and I started those um, because I think rather than just working on individual risks, it might be really important to strengthen civilization as a whole. Um, since some specific future risks we might not even know um, which they are. And since regardless of which risk we're facing, a strong civilization um, would probably be good regardless, um, whether it is robust, resilient, um, or even anti-fragile. <laughs> um, I think that that would be a good case and regardless of which risk we're facing. Um, and so um, this kind of concept resonates really well with the concept of existential hope, which was brought forth by um, Toby Ord and Owen Cotton Brown, and which made me start the website existentialhope.com. And most of the readings that we'll be discussing today, I sent them out via email before, and there's been a lot more added to that list, and they will be on the website later. Um, okay, and in these salons, um, we always tackle one topic of um, civilization per month. Um, we use we had one with Robin already on social incentives and on strengthening so social incentives. Um, we had one with June Yoon on counterculture, which was here. Um, we had one. Um, the last one was with David Eagleman and Arvind Gupta on strengthening our humanity, which was more bio and neurotech. And here we tackle the really big picture, which is civilization as a whole, um, and which trajectory um, we are on. And it's a really big shot. And we have a lot on our plate, uh, but I think uh, it will make for a really interesting discussion. And usually I start these salons with a slide that kind of goes like that, um, which is a little dark, but uh, it basically is the depiction of one of my favorite quotes. And, and if you could, could see, it starts with a big bang. And the quote starts with saying, um, it, it asks the question, who are we? And then continues by saying, um, it, who are we? 30.7 billion years ago, we were crammed into a single point. 10 billion years ago, we were stars exploding into existence. 3 billion years ago, we were bacteria. We were alive. A thousand years ago, we were all God's creations. A hundred years ago or so, we had proved we were one species, descended from apes. 60 years ago, we declared we're all human, entitled to the same human rights. And today, we stand at a bottleneck at this weird bottleneck where we can either be the forces linking to a fantastic future or we could really mess it up. And I think this encapsulates like the large picture in a very, very crude way. But um, what I want to do today is really kind of ask, okay, um, what is it if, if, if we don't get, right, or what, what are the actual kind of like more fine-grained scenarios that are not just X-Wiz or X-Hope, but what's actually there? Um, and even those descriptions might be a little bit too crude. Um, but we might want to be really looking at like what are the kind of like more fine-grained examples of the kind of futures that we might be creating and of the past that civilization could be taking. And there's everything from suffering, um, from suffering risk to extinction, uh, to subsystems like in Age of M, to uh, climbing upwards like in Enlightenment now, um, to real utopias. And one of them, which Mark might talk about, um, is the Parade Utopia. I want us to really like look um, at a more fine-grained analysis of those examples. Um, which will then hopefully enable us to take kind of like a more fine-grained path of actions towards creating the futures that we actually want to create. But we're going to be basically um, talking in three different parts. We're going to be talking about um, the ethics first. So what is the foundation on, um, on which we're basing all of those claims on? Why, why do we even care about those futures? Then we're going to be talking about what's on our plate. So where are we racing to? Um, and then lastly, we're going to have a call to action. What can we actually do? Um, about bringing the better of those features into existence. We have some really, really wonderful minds here that uh, will, prompt, will be prompting us up. We have Robin Hansen from FHI, Peter Eckersley from EFF, <coughs> Mark Miller, uh, who is a Forsyth Fellow, but also from Agoric, um, Paul Christiane from OpenAI, Christine from Forsyth Institute, and Alyssa Vance from Apprenti. And I'm hoping that we can prompt the discussion and then have a very, very interactive discussion um, with the rest of you. So please um, feel free to kind of chime in whenever um, after the first speaker kind of like has made a prompt. Um, and if that gets out of hand, we can, uh, we can maybe discuss some hand signs. But I think we're all a pretty civilized bunch, right? So 
Uh, let's see how well that goes. Let's start this off maybe. So in the first part where we're going to be talking about ethics, I want to talk about um, ethics in a nutshell, um, about moral progress or value drift, about uh, personal utopias, and uh, maybe a comparison of future beings and existing beings. <coughs> to start that off, I would love to start with Paul. Um, I read um, about your golden rule and your interpretation of the golden rule um, on your blog, and I would love if you could start us off with kind of like your broad um, ethical outlook um, and why, why to care about this. Yeah, so I am not a moral philosopher. This is mostly just my, like, I'm also a non-realist, so when I talk about ethical views, I'm just saying, like, what I prefer, like, what would I like to happen with the universe. Um, I guess my preference is, like, uh, I find the golden rule pretty compelling, ethical intuition. I think that's a common place to be. Um, that is, like, some things seem good when they happen to me. By extension, like, you know, if someone else was asking what ought I do, I like wish that they would take into account what things are good for me. Um, I would guess that my application of the golden rule is pretty commonsensical. It's like the same place to many people in this room. One place where I part ways with many people is like, I am willing to say sort of from behind the veil of ignorance, I don't know whether I would get to exist or not. And I have some preferences about between existence and non-existence. Um, and so I would also generalize those preferences. Like I would also apply the golden rule to such preferences. So like I would be much, much happier if I had twice as high a probability of existing. And I would generalize that to say like, I would be much, much happier if twice as many people got the opportunity to exist. Um, so I think the main question this ends up coming up for is like how much happier should we be with all of the universe versus just some small part of the universe? And I lean towards answers that are like much, much happier. That is like, yeah, if only like a trillion people got to exist, that would be like a great tragedy on this account. Because like for, for me personally, if mm -hmm. I only had a tiny probability of existing, that would be a great tragedy. If we can make like a trillion, trillion people, that's like a trillion times better. Um, so that's probably the main way in which I apply the golden rule. It's not completely standard. That is, I go from like me wanting a higher probability of existing to me wanting way more people to exist. What do people think? Um, more people, the more the better? More people, uh, or more beings <laughs> later in the universe, the better? I'm curious how you quantify this in terms of like, is it better to have like one person or a thousand rabbits and then you pull that up to like 10,000 people or one super intelligence? So, so I guess also to be clear, I don't actually expect that the best outcomes involve large numbers of people. I think that's like a lower bound. Things are at least as good as if we had like quadrillions of quadrillions of people, but I suspect the best outcomes will be like more unrecognizably strange. And like mostly I'm happy that we can like defer such... I think it would be like really catastrophically terrible if we had to like decide what we wanted to happen with the universe any time over the next hundred years. Like that would be super bad and like mostly things are okay because we can just wait. And like in a million years people can decide. Maintain the same preferences for existence. Um, if you were in like the bottom like 0.01% of poverty world. Certainly there are lots of possible ways I could be or lots of possible people I could be for whom I'd prefer not exist. And those people shouldn't like if I would prefer not exist, I'd prefer not exist, and if I'd prefer exist, I'd, like, I, it, it becomes complicated, but not, existence is not generically good. It's like a contingent fact about particular kinds of existence that makes them good. So, so that may answer the question is, 10 times more people, but 10% less happy, a better thing, because the overall sum is higher, uh, and how do you optimize that? One person super, super happy, obviously, you don't like that. I assume, I hope we can decide in a million years. <laughs> but as long as there are rival risk goods, the more people there are, the less... Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can, I, I think the idea of number of people sort of like breaks down when you think about artificial intelligences and you know, um, and species other than human. Um, I think it, this seems pretty obvious from a computer architecture standpoint, but it doesn't really get brought up very much in discussions of AI, which tend to assume that AI is like an alien species or something like that, who have different minds but sort of the same basic architecture. Humans have a very high bandwidth inside their brains, but a very low external bandwidth. Speech is like 300 baud, so you can like separate out <coughs> humanity into like distinct individuals and you know have this be like mostly a pretty good abstraction. Um, if you have like an intelligent computer system, you know, the ex question I like to ask is, well, how many AIs is Google or how many people is Google? Google is like one system that's designed to do one thing if you look at Google search, but then it's running on 100,000 computers and it's probably like, well, depending on how you segment it, it could be 100 pieces of code or 1,000 pieces of code or 10,000. So like, I, I don't think our moral philosophy is really equipped to handle that there's, yet. There's an open question about whether you can share thoughts and experiences between neural networks that are wired up a little bit differently, or whether language is something like a low bandwidth analog of the best possible communication that's possible between different neural networks. And that's like a totally open question that we won't get to answer until we have 
systems. But I wanted to hit Brad's point, which is like there is no way to optimize this thing. It's literally you, there, there, there's a like a demonstrated literature that says average well-being and total well-being are incompatible like dimensions that you somehow want to optimize those and fairness and avoidance of suffering, but they're actually not literally mathematically impossible to optimize simultaneously. And so I think that justifies the kind of humility that Paul has, which is like, we don't want to try to answer that question because we kind of know that there isn't a right answer. Um, I would like to uh, introduce a um, concept that I just heard from uh, Christine uh, just a few days ago, uh, uh, by contrast with the golden rule, the silver rule, um, uh, which is um, don't do unto others what you would uh, have them not do unto you. Um, uh, so the, the point here is um, a concept I'll call um, Pareto-topia. Any concept of utilitarianism or, or, or trying to, to imagine the good to some other creature imagines that there's some basis of utility comparison. As you said, when we're talking about a, a future with with AIs and creatures that are very different from us in which the discreteness and boundaries between them so that you can even think of, of there being beings to count. Um, uh, when we're talking about things that alien, the notion of thinking about its utility, is it suffering, is it happy, trying to compare it with us, I think that's all a hopeless kind of calculus to try to engage in. Um, but if we're only focused on human utility, then we're doing something um, uh, really atrocious. We're really being monsters um, because as cognition grows into the universe, uh, most of it will not be us. Uh, so the framework that I want to promote is the notion of voluntarism. Um, uh, Steven Pinker in uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature uh, shows that there's been this tremendous, incredible historical uh, trend towards reduction in violent interactions. Uh, to the, and, and that means that in comparison, um, civilization is a dynamic that's largely the outcome of voluntary interactions. Civilization has also been, in, has been, also been accelerating in the, the speed at which it's creating wealth. And I think a simple systemic first approximation way to understand how those things tie together is that um, in a framework of voluntarism, entities engage in voluntary interactions only if they expect to benefit from it, only if they expect it to serve their goals, whatever they are. And that framework is neutral. It enables a, a society, not necessarily human, not necessarily dominated by human-like things, a diverse society of many intelligences pursuing many, many different goals to interact and, and cooperate with each other so each can service its own goals better by virtue of its cooperative interaction with other creatures pursuing other goals. And that relates to um, mind uploads potentially because, or to other minds that we can't even imagine because we don't really need to, um, need to decide what is good for them, but we can just um, trust that they will know what is good for them and they will right. be in voluntary interaction with each other. Okay. Um, I think generally in terms of asking what is good and what isn't, um, I think you had an interesting concept of value drift, which um, some people might, might not have heard about here. One of the concrete tasks that people have called attention to is um, this phenomena that our descendants might be out of our control. <laughs> uh, and, and so we can make an analogy to our ancestors. Um, many of our ancestors uh, had preferences over how their children and grandchildren would live, uh, their religious practices, their patriotism, their, their fealty to their family clans, et cetera, and uh, they only partially succeeded. <laughs> Uh, you, you may celebrate that fact, uh, and we might think they would lament the fact that they failed <laughs> to make you act the way they wanted. Uh, when people look toward the future, they, they imagine a wide range of possible creatures, and then they imagine that those creatures will not act the way that we wanted, <laughs> and then they're concerned. <laughs> 
And there are several reasons why you might think that's more of a concern here, but the first thing to notice is just, well, uh, you could think all those ancestors, if had they had been offered the opportunity to like control their descendants, they might have taken it, <laughs> and you might be living different lives as a result because they might have controlled you and made you follow what they wanted. <laughs> um, and that problem will continue, but um, two, two main issues make it a bit different. So first of all, you might think um, the, the rate of change will speed up. And so now you will see more generations <laughs> equivalently of change in your lifetime than your ancestors might have. So as change speeds up, within any one lifetime, you see more change. And so it might really bug you more <laughs> to see how many more generations of change have not followed and done what you wanted. <laughs> um, so you know, that's, that's a cost of the high rates of change. A related thing is people say that there'll be more change in the future because of tech. That is, somehow we'll be now exploring a larger space of possible creatures, and so there's now a larger space of ways that your descendants could be different. I'm not sure that's really different from the fact that change will speed up, but it raises the question of how far are you willing to go to control your descendants? And so in some sense, you can. Uh, this is my way of framing the non-Foom-based AI risk concerns. <laughs> for, for people who see like a one machine in a basement taking over the world in a weekend, yeah, you gotta be concerned about that thing. If it's gonna happen, you, you, you have to, absolutely. <laughs> I'm more skeptical about that scenario, but I see somebody, some people should work on it, but I see other people who don't focus on that scenario, but they still are very concerned about AI risk, and this is how I frame their concerns, is that they're worried about what I'd call value, just a g generic process by which over generations, values drift, and that if that generic thing happens with your descendants, AI, X, M's, et cetera, then they will not do what you want. And if someone told you that maybe there's a chance you could stop that, <laughs> you might want that. And, and that's a hard choice to me, is whether you want to try to prevent your descendants from doing things different than you wanted. But in essence, that's the AI control problem. <laughs> the AI is your descendants. They are creating them, and they will go on. And if without the default is that they will be out of control in the sense that you can control them locally, but as new situations come up that you never anticipated, then they will do things you didn't anticipate and they will be in charge and you aren't, and you know, that's just the default. I have a question. Um, so it makes sense to not try to control your descendants. Would it make sense to try to control the, you know, values are a response to circumstances. Would it make sense to try and control the circumstances to say not have as much scarcity? Because when you've got scarcity, you have more competition and more kind of uh, like, tight constraints on things, whereas if you've got less scarcity, there's more opportunity to explore. The ways we have tried to control our descendants are myriad. <laughs> you know, we, we do just beating them over the head with our morality tales. <laughs> we, we, put the, we control their context in terms of education and early childhood and home environments, and we try to control the institutions and societies they live in in order to induce their world. So we, yes, we do all these things. Say San Francisco community members here who want to broaden that scope. They, they don't want to change people. They actually want to open the opportunity for people to realize their enormous independence and their responsibility to the rest of the world, right? And if your descendants because aren't open enough, you might want to make sure they're open enough because but that's what you want them to do. <laughs> <laughs> is that actually true? Or is that, is that just another <coughs> mode in which you'd like? No, that's exactly what he said. That was the counterpoint. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. So I, I want to um, uh, point at a particular um, forward-looking problem-solving at controlling descendants that I think has been, or if you want to call it that, I, wouldn't, I don't think I'd use that terminology, but that has been a tremendous success and that we should be inspired by, um, uh, which is James Madison. Um, uh, the uh, uh, legislation is a paperclip machine. Um, uh, large human institutions, large anything that where large large uh, numbers of humans are composed together um, uh, to engage in various activities, is a kind of superintelligence, and the alignment problem is there, which is when those human institutions are set in motion, often with certain goals in mind. Once they're set in motion, they might accomplish things very different than the ones they were set in motion to accomplish. Um, uh, Mad James Madison, the founding fathers, um, uh, were looking at a system knowing that, ver that it was about to be populated by various, various super intelligences, um, uh, governments, interest groups, all sorts of things, uh, where they were terrified of what we would now call the value alignment problem of how this could go wrong. They had a history 
of observing previous human institutions where things had gone very, very wrong. And the central idea behind what they were doing, uh, my view of it, uh, is that they weren't, he wasn't trying to optimize, he was trying to avoid bad outcomes rather than trying to get a best outcome. Um, and that the way he did it was by setting the, by, by creating multiple power centers and setting these um, uh, uh, partially in opposition to each other. Uh, and the, the, if, and overall, when I look back at this alignment problem with human organizations, I think the most robust overall lesson is avoid centralized power. Um, and I think that Madison's attempt to set up a game that was iterated in ways that avoided the worst dangers that he was fearful of, I think largely succeeded. And I think that, that we should be inspired by that example. It largely succeeded into a level of society and organization and communication that he could not have imagined. Nevertheless, the game he set up is a large part of the reason that we're leading good lives. Thanks. I think, um, Paul, you had the concept of, um, well, like a value lock-in or like the governments might um, pay it forward in terms in, in terms of values. So like almost like the opposite of value drift that eventually like a, um, a government of enough kind of like technological maturity might be able to lock values in over a really long time period um, and that this would probably be a worry, worrisome scenario, correct? Or um, Well, yes, I guess I don't have strong views about like governments versus like hum random humans versus other institutions or like the relative influence of them. Um, I think what I would normally talk about is like, so like the properties of our generation are determined by some combination of stuff the preceding generations did and like biological facts about humanity and so on. And in general, I think like as time goes on, like features of the world are more determined by preferences of people who are trying to get what they want than by like coincidence of nature. I believe that's also the case for characteristics of future generations. So like right now we live at a time when like the characteristics of each generation are mostly determined by um, facts about biology with some influence from preceding generations. I expect we will live to see a time when like the characteristics of following generations are mostly determined by the preferences of the preceding generations. So in that sense, like you get lock in and that like there's some notion of like that like you increase as this process goes on and like biological contingency is less important and preferences are more important you like shift, like there's a bunch of extra importance for preferences as that process occurs. What do you think we can do right now to affect the far future? Like you wrote one post for 80K. Uh, I, think there's a, yeah, I think there's a bunch of things, but like dying is the obvious one. Like if we were to, yeah. If we were to destroy all life on earth, <laughs> that would have an obvious and dramatic effect on the far future. Um, I think that's kind of... Oh yeah, so not dying would be positive. Um, <laughs> The, the other natural one is like, I think there is this distribution of like, like as a society, we have some collective preferences which are formed in a complex way as an aggregate of like the preferences of individual people and institutions. Um, and like changing that aggregate preference like has some effect and I think that that's growing over time as we approach this. So like, like in general, if you just made like an extra billion dollars right now, there's a reasonable chance that that would affect the entire future by virtue of you getting some influence. Or like if you got elected to office right now, there's a reasonable chance you get some amount of influence over the whole future. I think Robin really wanted to presumably object, but. I did want to disagree, but briefly. Uh, so, so I do think that in the last few hundred years, uh, preferences have come to matter more because we've been getting rich. So we move from a very competitive world where, in a very competitive world, your behavior is very constrained by what you have to do to survive. And most humans have lived in pretty competitive worlds up until a few hundred years ago. So they didn't have much slack and ability to choose. As we're in rich now, we have more ability to choose. And that means preferences now matter more as we get richer. But that's not at all guaranteed to continue. It's not necessarily a long-term trend. It's a current trend. And my book, Age of M, is about a scenario where that it no longer is true. Yeah, I think I'd buy this contingency on like the competitive pressures being relaxed. Like you could just like suppose the next generation, everyone is going to be engaged in like cutthroat competition and only literally the most efficient things are like, you know, within one part in a billion of the most efficient things survive. I still get to have like our generation gets to have some influence over who those competitors are. So like, if I want to influence the far future, I'm just like, great, I'm going to have some successor who is going to be ruthlessly cutthroat and has some set of values. And they're going to arrange to have another successor who is ruthlessly cutthroat and has their values. And like, even under competitive dynamics, you still have this influence of, like this influence still occurs. Like the characteristics of the next generation are still determined by some process, which like 
I'm gonna argue for over time is increasingly like preferences of like the process that shaped the generation rather than or, like actors prior to that generation rather than biological coincidence. How much does wealth matter? That, that is, you, if you have wealth now and you could spend it, how much how much percentage influence does wealth now have in the long run? Uh, if that's certainly like a symptom of this thing. There's also like political influence would be similar. Like all forms of influence would be similar. Um, or like being a person, cultural influence, but like wealth is a very obvious one that's easy to talk about. I, I mean, just in, in the future that, that wealth is not being in the third dimension, right? So that, that if you're an M in 3 plus 1D space time, you are not nearly what it would be to be an infinitely dimensional plasma state, right? Which I think if we're trying to come up with like, like this sort of like platonic, most powerful thing that we could conceptualize to be, it, it resembles that. And so I would say, what is my path from here to infinite dimensional plasma stage? Because you don't want to do that tomorrow. You want to but how do you know how long to wait and when it's time to act? Like, let's say, with your acquired wealth. You know, how do you know that, oh, no, I, I should just postpone a little bit longer, like, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Like, when do you know that now's the time? I'm big on the not dying. So, like, to the extent that you see ways to spend money to not die, that seems like an excellent thing to do. I'm and similarly, like... <laughs> I think that's like my best this guess. Not that's not how I intend to spend the money I have. Like to pick up this thread of the generation's cause and effect, you know, generation to generation, you know, whether or not that's an act is like actually, you know, where it intended to go. But shouldn't you start the chain now so that you can have some cause and effect through the generations, through the future? I think there could be and versions whether or not that it's competitive. Like, like, yeah, yeah. time. I think like Christine had a had an item that was going, or at least a little bit in opposition to it, where you were basically saying, well, we don't, we, we know what we can have. If you weigh um, the change that we can have in the future against the change that we can have right now, right now, you know, it's this locality, we are, we're fairly certain about what change we can affect and how, um, and that might not be so in the far future. Well, you know, I've been with Foresight for a long time and we believe in working far upstream. So it's not that I don't believe in trying to affect the long-term future. Um, I do. The difficulty is knowing how to do that f effectively. And you might even get the sign wrong, right? And, and it's possible that even some of the things I've done in my own life possibly had the sign wrong. That is possible. I, I mean, we could definitely argue that one. But, um, and I might argue in favor of being on the wrong side of it. So, so the challenge, when you look far ahead, uh, you have to try to say, well, how, is there anything we can do that where we at least get the sign right? Um, so, so this comes back to the humility point, right? Yes, we want to make the future better in the long term. How can we do that um, and uh, that has a chance of coming out positively? So, um, so if we think back 200 years and say, all right, what could those people have done for us? If we could send a message back, and have any influence on them, what message would we send back to them? Um, some people who are environmental would say, could you not kill off all of the animals? Or please do not cut down all the trees and get rid of their, their, uh, their habitat. Some people might send a message back saying, could you please not do what you're doing to the Native Americans? Uh, but, but when you think about their situation, I don't think these are messages that would, if they had, didn't have those messages from us, they would, I don't think they would have a thought of these things. Even if they were thinking about us right now, I don't think they would have thought of those things. What would, so is there anything that they could have thought of that would actually make sense? Or a message that we could send back to them that would actually make sense, not just for us, but for them and all the people in between, right? Is there any, not a, we're not looking for universals here, but is there anything that's pretty damn positive? Well. Don't die comes is at the top of the list. So, hey, you guys, do you know? Do medical research. Look under the you know. Invent the microscope. Look at the water. Clean up the water and get rid of all the waterborne diseases earlier. That's a big win. Um, that would be a clear win across the board. And the other one I think relates to what Mark was saying, which is um, something that people had done in the 1770s, which was try to go for political freedom. Try to minimize coercion, try to maximize opportunity. Um, for If we're talking about human beings, this seems like a, a pretty good universal. In other words, this is, comes back to the silver rule. 
We don't have to decide for them, we don't have to give them what we think they should have. What we want to do is free up their world so that they can pursue their own goals. So, um, I, I, you, there was a mention of what happened historically versus what might happen in the future. I think it's important to distinguish where for most of the life of humans or most of the history of humans, we, you know, we were at subsistence because we were part of our Darwinian biological evolution and our environment was largely constrained by participating in that process. We now can learn from each other. We're now part of a different kind of evolution. So many of the lessons we might think to learn from that history could easily be just completely irrelevant. Right? We, there's no reason why we don't keep building vastly more wealth than, 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 you know, per, per capita than we ever had before simply because we're able to consciously engage in the process and have some influence on, on, on how these processes were embedded, work, and how they reward us, and, and how they function. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> the ability to talk to each other and generate wealth does not mean we escape a competitive world. Sure, um, but it does let us control it to, to some large extent. If you we made were the comment about for the most of human history, we've been at subsistence, but that's not true from a population point of view. Most of human population has been in the last 150 years. Distinguish two entirely scenarios. If we were to all coordinate with a powerful world government to make collective decisions, then we could take control. If we don't do that and each one of us innovates and talks to each other, we are still in a competitive world where competitive outcomes can come as a result of our local uh, progress and wealth creation. One of the lines I've found, first of all, let me, let me agree that the logic of evolution iterated leads to the overall ecosystem being dominated by creatures at subsistence. I think that's correct, and I think it's inevitable, and I think that there's no practical way to avoid that. However, we without need... Without the world government. Without the world government. No, no, there, there's no route to avoiding that in which the cure is not worse than the disease. Um, the, um, uh, a line that I remember from your book that I thought was just great, I think it was from your book, maybe it was from your blog, um, is lives at subsistence can be worth leading. Um, uh, if we're, um, so several points. One is that um, uh, the system is dominated by activity at subsistence, but that doesn't mean that that's where most of the experiencing and um, the things that we would project the issue of valuation on. Uh, right now, most of the biosphere um, is not human. The total volume of bacteria exceed the volume of human beings by several orders of magnitude. Um, so, and, and bacteria are, are at subsistence, nobody's worried about their suffering. Um, you would not, um, the, 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 so the, so, so the, the, so, so the thing is, um, creatures that are suffering when they're at subsistence are probably the most, not the most efficient ways to use subsistence activities. Um, I, so I don't expect subsistence leads to suffering. Uh, the other thing is that in a world in which GDP is doubling every few weeks, which is another thing that you paint in Age of M, the returns to capital are enormous. So sur the creation of surplus is enormous. So when we say dominated we, uh, by, um, uh, by the logic of evolution, we need to be careful what weighting we're using. The activity is dominated by whatever is most efficient because efficiency leads to more activity. But, um, the, uh, but that's only one weighting that we can bring to it. Um, uh, if we... Um, focus on the lives that are created in surplus uh, and the use of the surplus together with incredible returns um, uh, to capital um, uh, can create vast lives above subsistence of great wealth that, that in which the total volume of the wealthy lives with surplus exceed our puny selves and our entire existence by many, many orders of magnitude. Um, so, and, and the lives of subsistence don't even need to be 
cognitive things, it's not clear that's the best way to, to optimize efficiency as subsistence. So with regard to the activity at subsistence, the bacteria might actually be the better comparison. My, my uh, question is, or comment is uh, related to that, um, and also circling back to the question of um, if we were to pass a message back uh, 200 years, what, uh, what change we might, wanna, we might have wanted to see um, around uh, moral decision making. And expanding the circle of moral concern seems like the obvious choice since that's taken us longer than it should have and we're still in that process. I think many of us see the everyday things today that will be moral horrors to generations in the future, industrial meat complex, prison industrial complex. Uh, there's all sorts of examples there. Um, and so I'm curious to hear how you guys think about uh, ways to accelerate the expansion of the circle of moral concern in anticipation of emulated minds, um, in anticipation of AGIs. And I think that circles back to the, 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 the other question of if our model for how to constrain an AGI is slavery, that's a chain god doesn't sound like a good outcome. So. I don't know that's a totally adequate response to a great question, but it's sort of a hybrid of, of the answer that, uh, like answering some of what you had and some of what Brad had, which is love is also partly a response to need uh, in, in animals and in us. Uh, if you have offspring that are formed every like two years, 30 years, 50 years, whatever it is, like they need to be raised and trained and like taught to deal with the world and protected. And so, uh, if we want to keep love, we need to think, like, will it be uh, disincentivized by beings that are digital and don't die? And and once they reach competence, like, you know, they'll need love in the same way that people need friends, but they won't need it for the profound existential reasons that babies need love. And uh, so if we if we and this is a bit of should we shape the future, Robin? Like, if we want to keep love, we maybe need to think about like, how do we incentivize it or, or build it in? Back, back, to, back to Aurora's point about how do we expand the entities that we care about. Um, so I'm not sure how we do that, but we can get an, a hint perhaps from what happens, uh, how, what is the process for, for, those, for that caring to constrict? What drives it smaller? What is it that makes us pull, pull away? And um, one thing that does that is economic stress. The more economic stress people are under, the more they don't care about those people, either in the future, on the other side of the world, people of a different color, you name it, they care less about it the more economic stress they're under. So from that, perhaps we can speculate that um, people who are, feel very secure, feel very well off, feel super healthy, you know, feel excellent in every way, they have the luxury of expanding that and I have to say, you know, people in this room, I mean, do people get much luckier than we are? I don't think so. So that's why this question comes up. We have the luxury of asking that question. So how can we help other people feel as secure as many of us feel here? I think we're missing, you know, the essence of Chris's very important point, which is it's very hard to look far into the future and figure out what you could do now concretely to make a substantial difference on the future from the point of view of the things you want to do. <laughs> so if the future could come and give you some advice, what you'd be wanting them to tell is how could I get my wishes in that future through your advice? If the message from the future is, we have different preferences from your, you and these are our new preferences, you should just adopt ours, that's not very persuasive to me in how I can achieve my ends, that's like, they have, I've failed to control them, and, and they are telling me to, uh, to give in. Uh, and so it's actually really hard to, setting aside the moral things. It's easy to say, yes, they should adopt our morals and tell the past to adopt our morals and tell the future to adopt our morals, tell everybody to adopt our morals, because <laughs> everybody thinks their morals are great. But if you look at from their point of view, you know, it's hard. And from our point of view, it's just really hard to concretely, that's why I think that abstract ethic discussion is somewhat misdirected because it's hard enough to find any concrete things you can do to have a substantial influence. You might as well focus on the few things you can think of and ask what should you do in that, those spaces. But what place where we disagree with you, Robin, is her suggestion about expanding the circle of moral concern. I think if we manage to get a message back to the founders, framers of the Constitution, they were very much interested in that idea. They would think of it very differently than we 
we would at this point, but some of the things that we think it took them a long time or the, the institutions they built up to get a long time to, freeing the slaves, etc. a lot of them believed in that and didn't know how to do it in the situation they were in. So you want to explain to them the instrumental advantages of the larger circle of morals. Don't just tell them, follow my morals, but tell them why yeah, that yeah, works. I'm not saying, I think, I think that's a very general thing that can apply over time, whatever your current circle of moral concern, Think about how to expand it because that's the direction that, that leads to more of the, the equality and prosperity and, and uh, uh, kinds of institutions that, that you actually believe in. Though there's a great passage in Jeremy Bentham which, where he goes through the list of predicted expansions of the like moral circles of consent and he kind of nails all of the ones like children, slaves, like uh, animals, like he, you know it's quite a long list and it's basically all of the rights movements that we've had over the last few hundred years. Like so there were people running around in that era that Christine is talking about who, who, who had sort of seen this coming and it, it took a few hundred years for civilization to catch up. You're trying to get out of the back. He's been All waiting right. for a long time. <laughs> okay, and yeah, do you just want to shout it out? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple interesting points with like, what we can actually do. I think one of them is that the technology to persuade people or influence people has gotten a lot more powerful. So you potentially can make like larger changes faster. And there's an interesting question of like, should we do this given that uh, this is kind of conflicts with the sort of respecting people's agency thing? But like we're soon going to have propaganda that's a lot better than we've ever had before because we just have a lot more powerful tools for it. So like, do we do that because we might be able to like lock in more value and care about and expand the moral concern, or do we not do that or try to prevent that because it's going to you know not respect people's goals or? Well, my, my related question is that you know when we talked about Paridotopia earlier about giving people the option to choose for themselves. Um, and you mentioned, oh, uh, but that's just you enforcing on upon them the option to choose for themselves because you value options. So, you know, it's almost like, you know, it's turtles all the way down. Um, and is there anything, you know, that you can do that um, is kind of like unbiased or that would be good in, in all worlds? Because I would think the only thing would be to give everyone the option to choose for themselves. But you were mentioning even that is biased by your own preference for options. You know, I, I love Robin's stuff. I love, but every like once, like, like one in a thousand times he goes too far. And this is one of them, okay? Having, giving people choices, giving entities options is just gonna be something they like. I think I can stick with that one.